audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. You're listening to Momentum, a show that helps men succeed in life. And as we delve into this week's topic, a reminder that some of the content may be of a sensitive nature. Now, here's your hosts, Tim and Dez. It is Momentum. Hello. Welcome. Uh, great to have you tuning into the show. It is Tim and Dez with you once again. And before we go any further, Dez, how are you this week? You well? Yeah, really good, man. Thank you. That's good. You know, when you get to my age, you know, you, you have to pretend you're really good. Do you? But I actually, I actually am really good. Yeah. A good stage in my life. Uh, well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear, man. And, and look, the fact that we step into this space every week is awesome. And we, we love this. And uh, hopefully you listening get something from, from the shows. I mean, otherwise, Des and I are just talking to ourselves, which is never a good thing. But uh, in all seriousness, you know, that the whole point of momentum is to, to help men do life better. And so we talk about stuff that hopefully is relevant to you. You can get something from, maybe bring an awareness, maybe bring some stuff up so you can deal with it and move forward. And, you know, that's the whole purpose of Momentum. And uh, so we're going to give you a few, you know, things to think about now, right now. MomentumAustralia.org, our website. Bunch of different shows on there around a bunch of different topics. You can uh, have a listen to the, 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 the back package at some stage and uh, hopefully they'll help you out. And, of course, get in touch with us as well. And, uh, look, if you feel like financially supporting us, that would be awesome. Uh, we don't have a lot of support around Australia and yet our show does go around Australia and podcast listened to internationally in over 60 countries, which is fantastic. So we're helping men all around the world. And if you'd like to help us do that, uh, MomentumAustralia.org is uh, a great resource. As is our Momentum care line does, I'll let you uh, introduce that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're so blessed to have a really easy to remember number one eight hundred triple zero men. For guys, if you're doing life on your own and you want a safe and confidential conversation, please reach out to our care line from nine a.m. to eleven p.m. seven days a week. It's available one eight hundred triple zero men six three six. And also don't forget our YouTube channel. And um, we're so blessed to have this channel. And so you search for momentum underscore four underscore men uh, on YouTube, and you'll find find us and uh, you're going to be able to see us as well as hear us. A bit scary, I understand, but yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, it is cool. And look, uh, I think we talked about in, the, in uh, one of our previous shows, is what, one of the first videos that we uploaded on the YouTube was with our guest today, Jonathan Doyle, uh, life coach, author, speaker, amazing guy with an amazing brain. And Jonathan's back with us today. <laughs> Hey, Jonathan, I saw your face when I said that. You just operate on a different level, mate. <laughs> uh, no, I've just got – I've still got kids and and they, they keep me very, very grounded. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on stage, I, I get these fancy introductions and uh, – yeah, as soon as I get home, I go I come back to reality very quickly. To reality, <laughs> you walk in through the yeah. door, reality hits. I get it. I, I grew up with brothers too, and I was the youngest for many years, so I don't, um, I don't, I don't get ahead of myself too quickly. That's yeah. a good thing. But you do a lot of reading, man, and you do a lot of stuff, and you've brought a lot to momentum over the years, man. Yeah. We appreciate that because you do. You operate on different levels, and you you read a lot, and you bring a lot of this stuff not only into your own life, but then you impact a lot of people as a result. Last time we talked, we talked a bit about core beliefs, and we're interesting human beings, right? I mean, we're fascinating in the way that we operate, and so we want to just kind of bounce off that this week and start with the idea of self sabotage. The fact that we would sabotage ourselves is a really interesting concept. So let's. I guess, start there. Why the heck do we do that? (laughs) Let's start with the easy one. (laughs) The first thing is, is that if you've ever done it, you're in very good company because (laughs) turn on your television for five minutes and you're going to see some A-list celebrity blowing up spectacularly, right? So (laughs) self-sabotage doesn't seem to be excluded by position, wealth, power. It's Most of us at some point in life seem to have a really red-hot go at doing it. So the, (laughs) the obvious question is why would we, right? And we mentioned this in a previous episode that we would like to believe that we are always acting in our own best interests, Mm. that we are always on our own side, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So what explains it? The best, I guess, explanation that I've worked with over the years is that self-sabotage is a manifestation of unresolved internal emotional conflict. Ah. Wow. I've been reading about it for many years and obviously working with executives on it. And this comes from a guy called Peter Michelson, and he wrote a really good book called Freedom from Self-Sabotage. A lot of stuff in this area is pretty fluffy. It's like, you know, you need to love yourself and stare in the mirror every day and say affirmations. And maybe that works. I don't know. But this book, he's a psychotherapist. It was very well written. So he talks a lot about these unresolved internal emotional conflicts, right? So what we need to understand is that 
we're actually always looking for congruence in how we see ourselves. We actually try and act in the world the way we think we are. The problem with these unresolved internal emotional conflicts are they're internal and they're often subconscious and they're not at top of our mind. So we might think that we like ourselves. We might think we deserve to be successful. We might write goals about it. But if that deeper internal architecture is fractured or broken, we are only going to let ourselves get so far in life before we do something to retard it. And another way to think about it is like a thermostat in a house. You know, once you set a thermostat, say in Australia at 21 degrees in summer, then the system's going to turn on and off and keep coming back to that baseline. So a way to think about self-sabotage is whatever your internal baseline is, if you think you're a really good person and you're kind and the people like you, you're going to keep moving up and down around that baseline. If you think you're damaged goods and you don't deserve anything good in life, you're going to keep doing things. Like if people are really nice to you or your career starts going really well, there's a good chance you're going to do something to bring yourself back to that baseline of I'm not a good person, nothing works for me. That's the basic mechanics. Uh, It's an internal tension between what we say we want and what we say is important to us and what we actually believe we deserve. That would probably explain the dynamics of self-sabotage. Is there a process you go through to do that? I mean, if you're if somebody who's listening, who's you know understands and recognizes this, this self sabotaging that they're doing. I mean, it, are there steps that you can take on that journey that you would recommend? Yeah, the first step is to say to yourself, if nothing changes, what does this cost me? Yeah, right. That's the first step. Oh, that's good. So, if you're a guy that's maybe got some addictive pattern, whether it's pornography, sex addiction, alcohol, time wasting, social media, violence, aggression, you lose your, you, you blow up at the smallest thing. The first step is to is to is to have the courage to say to yourself. What does life look like if this never changes for me? Wow, that's good. Mm. If this never changes, what does it look like at 40, 50, 60, 70, 80? What's my legacy? What am I leaving behind? What if nothing changes? And as you guys know, tomorrow I turn 50. And I'm and one of the things that's been happening for me as I hit that milestone is I'm like really accepting that when you're younger, you think life goes on forever. You're like, yeah. it's just you just life goes forever. And uh, <laughs> now I'm going, oh man, I'm 50. I don't feel 50, but I'm like, time's finite, Jonathan. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. you're not going to have forever mm-hmm. to work these things out. Like, if you want to be the best you can be for others in this time that you've got left, what still needs to change? So step one is to go, if I don't change, what's the future look like? Step two is to create environments by which you can encounter the truth. So silence, stillness, you know, because I travel so much, I I get to sit in some of the most beautiful cathedrals in the world. In the last few, the last two months, I've been in St. Louis, Oklahoma, New Orleans, California, and I'll go and sit in these beautiful churches. And sometimes it's just sitting in those spaces that just give you that space and that time to really access a different level of of your of your consciousness and then from there it's for me it's journaling i used to worry about people finding my journals i was like oh <laughs> and now i'm like well if someone finds it and reads it in my own family then i would you know disown them and make them leave no i wouldn't do that but i'd be like <laughs> but I'm, I'm starting to go no you got to do this you got jonathan you've got to have the freedom mm. to tell yourself the truth and mm. so I, I journal a lot and then there's the prayer piece there's just asking god to slowly reveal to me the places of um of woundedness and brokenness i mean the sabotage comes out of brokenness it comes out of wounds and so that's that's some of the basic steps for me anyway i love that but i but i have a i have a question a lot of us if we could we would change ourselves right i mean and the truth is that we're giving people keys to do that but having the support base around us is crucial and we've talked about that before and you mentioned about having the trusted safe spaces to go to to tell you the truth. I mean, that's important as well, right? But I had a conversation with someone this morning about, and it was a very simple piece of simply having somebody else. And I think we talked about having someone listening in the last show, Jonathan, people just listening to you, feeling like you, you're seen and you're, you're heard, right? But having somebody actually believe in you at a core level, 
Because a lot of us, I think, have done life where we haven't had that person and our mum and dad perhaps didn't do that. Or, you know, we, we've never really had that person that's, that's sat and gone, but eyeballed me and gone, but I believe in you. I believe that you can do this. I believe that you can become this person that you dream of or want to become. Or, you know what I mean? Just having somebody in that space to come alongside you and go, but you've made some, you know, whatever. Maybe you've done made some wrong choices, but, but I believe in you. I still believe in you. I'm here for you. Like, tell us about the importance of that. Not just someone to have a listening ear and tell you the truth at times, but to have someone that can say, I actually believe in you. Because I don't think many of us have had that. Man, I'm like literally, seriously, like I'm, I almost said the hair on my head standing up, but there's not a lot of that. Um, <laughs> Tim, I, I, that's brilliant. Like, <laughs> that is brilliant. You're right. It is not enough just to have someone to listen to you. We are desperate. Men, many men are desperate for a man of a certain type to look at them and see what they could be and not just what they are. You know, I've had a few of those in my life and there's one particular guy and I'll just give him a shout out. So Phil Ryle is a is a businessman that owns Harvest Pilgrimages and um, they do global Christian pilgrimages, an amazing guy. And Phil has lavished time and care over me. Like a few years ago, we were going through a really challenging time and and he would ring me on a Saturday morning for two to three hours every Saturday. And I just couldn't, I, I just still like, he was such a busy guy and still is, but he would speak into my life and into the future. And it had such an effect over time. Right. And now as I get a bit older, I'm, I'm starting to be privileged enough to, to do that for mm. some others. And, you know, I just want to encourage the men listening. You either need to find someone like that, and some of you listening need to become someone like that. Mm. And both, in fact. Yeah, yeah. It's such a gift just to have an older man go, no, nah, this is not the end. This is not going to end in disaster. We are going to turn this around. This is who you really are. This is what God's plan is and the heart is for your life. Yes, it's a disaster right now, but mm. that's not the story. It's, an end. it's not ending here. And you know, I keep telling people, God doesn't tend to put full stops on stories. He doesn't tend to go, well, that's mm. it for you. <laughs> like, you know, mm. you've really screwed up now. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, he's always writing the story. So, Tim, that's brilliant. I, I hadn't thought of that. And um, I'm just going to take what you've said and pretend yeah. that I came up with it. <laughs> <laughs> you can use it. <laughs> because, man, what a blessing. We yeah. go find that man. And if you can't find him, start praying that he'll come into your life. Nice. I was literally in Dallas, Fort Worth Airport a few weeks ago, and I got a text out of nowhere from a guy that I used to, you know, mentor. I first ran into him when he was, you know, it's 20 years ago, and I hadn't heard from him for years. And I got this text, and it was just like, JD, I'm in trouble. It's really bad. I need, and I literally texted him from Dallas. I said, mate, I hear, I gotcha. I said, and then a few weeks later, I was in another city back in Australia. We met up, and I just had the privilege of listening to him. And um, it's awesome. It's just a, it's a real privilege to do that kind of stuff. Mm. We're going to take a short break. Um, I think the two key things off that last little part, find someone like that, but also can you be that to somebody else? And that's a great encouragement. And that actually kicks right back into our, our first show with Jonathan where we talked about this selflessness in our lives. How do we serve other people? Yeah, we need those people in our lives, but can we become that to somebody else as well? Going to leave you with that thought as we take a short break on this week's Momentum. We'll be back with Jonathan Doyle in just a moment. Stay tuned. This is Momentum, a show that helps men succeed in life. Find out more at MomentumAustralia.org. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401 132 888. You're listening to Momentum, a show that helps men succeed in life. Find out more at MomentumAustralia.org. All right, welcome back to this week's show. It is uh, a great conversation with our special guest, Jonathan Doyle. Hope you've enjoyed the first part of the show. We're going to launch back in. And uh, and just another light and fluffy thing to uh, to wrap up this show, Jonathan, <laughs> as we step into the idea of uh, procrastination. 
right? I mean, we've covered some fairly tough bases so far, but procrastination, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, it can look like we can procrastinate in various different ways, you know, um, whether it's avoidance, uh, just not doing things, running away from things. Uh, uh, I mean, I suppose let's start with what might procrastination look like in our lives? Yeah, like I think we're all pretty familiar with it. It's the nagging sense of there is something I must that I that I really need to do that it's pressing, but the the simultaneous experience of oh, but there's something there's something interesting over here. <laughs> I'll just go. And, there's an Irish saying: "Don't do today what you can put off until tomorrow." Yeah, yeah. In, 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 in business, we call it bright shiny objects. It's like you know, <laughs> you're right. like. You know, there's the grunt work you need to be doing, and it's like, oh, but look, this new software yeah, over here. Oh, look. <laughs> so there's two components to this. Um, the the first part is okay. So why do we procrastinate? Again, we're back to what we've discussed in a re- in a few recent shows, which is surely we're reasonable, surely we're rational, surely we know what we need to do. Why don't we do it? So there's two components to the procrastination piece. One is procrastination works as a mechanism by which we can reinforce our own sense of unworthiness. We're probably procrastinating because the thing that we need to do will often move us forward in life. That could be going to the gym. It could be going out for dinner with a spouse. It could be having a tough conversation. It could be filling out a resume and improving that and applying for better jobs. And so why wouldn't we do that? These are good things. Surely we want them, so why don't we do them? Because as we've talked about in this show already, if your inner thermostat is set at a five and your new job is going to make you an eight, you're going to struggle to do that and you're going to find ways to not do it. You're going to find ways to undermine and sabotage yourself. So the first part of procrastination is we're avoiding something because it'll make our life better and we're not sure if we deserve it. And that's hard for people to hear, but I think that's pretty powerful. I'll give you an example of that in just a sec. Uh, The second part is that the project itself can be quite big and it's the the old saying of how do you eat an elephant, like one piece at a time. So the other part of procrastination is sometimes the, the, the thing you need to do is complex or big and there's this sense of like blah. It's like, oh, man, where do I start? Where do I start? And so the the point is simply to start. And I I recommend people check out Mel Robbins' five-second rule. She's pretty Mm. good on this. Mm. A lot of the time, if you can just get moving, if you can just get started, you'll be fine. And an example of that is I've always been up early for training and stuff, but I recently bought myself an old-school alarm clock, the one with the big things that whack on the side (laughs) and then the bell. (laughs) And so what I did, yeah, what I did is I've got, I've got my training watch, which has a vibration mode, so it doesn't beep and wake Karen up. But I would set it for, say, four, and then I would set the big alarm clock for 4.05 and put it, <laughs> and put it out in the kitchen. Right. Uh, so I knew that once this thing started vibrating, if I didn't, yeah, you had five minutes. <laughs> I'm waking up the family and the dog and everything. Yeah. So my point is that I had to find a system just to get myself to start. And yes. once that did, that helped. And and just finally, I, I said I'd give you an example of the um, – well, the, the, here's an example that captures both parts of this, the, the part of low self-esteem and the part mm. of – so I remember a while ago working on a big consultancy project and really – it was really big. It was really complex and involving hundreds of people and I was leading that. And there were two things that – that I look back on and I think one was it was so big and complex that there was mild procrastination because I'm just like, oh, where do I start? Yeah. And the way I did is I just created an environment where I could work. So I went back to the National Library and locked myself in there and just got it done. So sometimes you got to put yourself in a place where you can just get it done, clear your decks. And the second part was this work when I first did it was was really high profile and it was – I think there was a part of me that was like, wow, this is a big deal, right? These are really influential people. And to do it well and to do it successfully forced me to grow and to to realize that I was the kind of person that could do that kind of work. So mm. so those are the pieces, you know. We've, we've got to realize that our procrastination is a way of avoiding our greatness. Maybe to summarize it like that, procrastination is a tool for avoiding your greatness. Yeah. And, and also, um, 
I mean, I, I, I get exactly what you're saying because, you know, if I've got a report to write or whatever, I will leave it to the last minute when I have to do it, mm. right? Because I know that at that point I'll get it done. Yeah. Right? Instead of doing it right up front when you've got the brain, you know, the brain's ready to do it, but you put it off, right? Yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's interesting. I think there's also a lot to be said for the practical aspects of scheduling and environment. Environment matters. Like, I can't work at home. I just cannot. I, I've still got this thing that my mother has, which is if I know that there is another room in my house that's messy, I can't do any work. I, I, I'll just be thinking, <laughs> oh, that room's messy. And some people couldn't care less. But I'm like, and that's procrastination. So I'm like, you know what? When I go to the National Library, it's just like a cathedral of study. It's dead silent and I work and I work for 10 or 12 hour stretches. So create good environments, you know, don't try and do things in the wrong environment and then schedule them. Just say, right, clear my decks. I'm going to be, I'm going to be hitting this at eight o'clock in the morning. Just do the practical stuff, but also realize the bigger psychological forces in play as well. Yeah, and I think it's important that we just take a step at a time, isn't it? You know, if you're in that mindset that you're, you're procrastinating, take that first step. Because then the second step is easier, then the third step is easier. Doing ultra marathons, one of the things that we talk about is can you can you take one more step? Like yeah. and you almost always can. And with procrastination is can you can you just take a step? Can you just take a step? Because then, you know, you get, you may have heard of this word, momentum, right? Mm. That sounds familiar. You get momentum. <laughs> and, and once humans have momentum, they're like, you know, there's, there's almost nothing we can't do once we get started on it. But I really want to leave people with that this idea that all of us have this incredible giftedness and capacity and you, you don't want to be living your life burying that stuff, you know? Like mm. procrastination is a tool to avoid your greatness. And, mm. and also procrastination will often be a way of – I mean, none of us would do this on purpose, but it, it, it withholds our gifts from others as well. Like if you just if you just get on with life and do the stuff you need to do, it's going to be good for other people as well. So I, I was a little distracted because I wanted to find a quote and I found it. And Jonathan, you probably know this, Des, you may know this too, by Marianne Williamson. And it says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You're a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Yeah, so good. And I think, you know, just on that, Tim, I, I, I've been doing this with audiences lately where I say, I say, look, is anyone in the room got, got a kid who's, say, you know, under the age of 10, right? And someone will put their hand up and I'll say, okay, tell me the kid's name. And, you know, the dad's name will be, say, you know, Mark and the kid's name would be like Sophie. And I'll say, Mark, have you ever done this in your life? Have you ever like said to Sophie, hey, Sophie, come here, stand stand here in front of daddy. Look, daddy needs to ask you a favor. Can you do something for dad? And Sophie's like, sure, dad, whatever. And I say, you know, have you ever said to Sophie, Sophie, for the rest of your life, could you try for dad to be really, really average? (laughs) And the, and the audience cracks up. It's pretty funny when I do it live because no parent in their right mind has ever said to their own child, look, mum and dad love you very much. Our hope for you is that you're really mediocre. <laughs> and we laugh, right? Yeah. But I said if, if we as parents are able to look at our own kids and say, hey, I can see your talent. Look at you. Like you could do this. Like so much of the parenting role is pushing our kids forward. And we are a pale reflection of the the parenthood of God. And I think God looks at us. I think as Christians too, we can struggle with this because we can think it's pride, right? Like to really, because mm. you look at your Muhammad Ali's and your Conor McGregor's and you're like, oh, is that just pride? And I go, if I had to choose between a life of, I think mm. I'm a miserable worm or yeah. How Conor McGregor sees himself. <laughs> <It's gonna laughs> go that way. Like, I'll tell you the truth. Like, I've been so blessed to do the speaking work, and 
and just the privilege of getting up in front of big crowds and ripping it. I'm like, I want to do more of that. I want to bless more people. And Mm. so I think people listening, there's no, there's no different importance in our talents. Like it's not because one person speaks or one person's a janitor. There's any difference. It's just, let's go big, right? Like Mm. we're, we're not here forever. Like let's go big. Let's, let's, Let's stop avoiding the things we know we need to do. Mm. Let's go let's big. Get, let's let's yeah. get after it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to end the show there, but encourage you to have a listen back to this one. And in fact, all of Jonathan's previous shows that we've done <laughs> on Momentum, there's so much in there yeah. uh, that is food for thought. And uh, we'll, we'll set you on a journey and uh, encourage you to start taking those steps. And if you're already on the journey, keep going, man, because there is, there's always more to uncover. And, uh, Uh, dare we say a greater version of yourself that is currently lying dormant that you are afraid of perhaps exposing or becoming Jonathan it's always a great chat man thank you so much for your time over the last few weeks it's been awesome thanks for your time over Momentum Man thanks guys I love what you're doing and just want to encourage every man there to reach out to the Momentum website and and yeah just build that support and there's so many great men out there that want to support you and and also there's so many men that will need your support as well so thanks for having me and uh, absolutely love it you've been listening to Momentum a show that helps men succeed in life. For more information or to hear this week's show again, go to MomentumAustralia.org. You can also access a whole range of resources to help you on your journey and to get in touch with the team at MomentumAustralia.org. Until next time, keep moving forward with Momentum.